Hello, Nikolai. Hello. You know, Nikolai, I'm full of grief. It often happens that on various internet forums and on social media, I have to communicate with people who actually argue that ancient Egyptians had zero skills. Though all of us read about them in school books and watched some films. In other words, ancient Egyptians allegedly did not have any tools and technologies necessary to create all those things that are shown to tourists in Egypt nowadays. Even guides at the Museum of Egyptian Antiquities in Cairo say they don't know how such impressive bores in granite could be made. As far as I understand, you do know how such bores can be made. And in your experiments you have proved that this can be done with tools which ancient Egyptians had at hand such a simple copper tube. Am I right? Yeah, sure. But how? With a copper tube? With a copper tube. But copper is softer than granite. It is softer, but it does not drill granite. And what does? Abrasive mineral. Like ordinary sand? Yes, quartz sand, which can be found at a riverbank or other places. Besides sand, they also used corundite or emery rock for this purpose. They know how to mine and use it. Corundite was even identified inside a granite sample, that is, in a bore. Also, today we know deposits where Egyptians could mine it. And is this tool made by you? Yes. Why is it shaped like that? Let's look at its structure. I see this copper tube. Yes, the copper tube is the main component here. And the handle is carved out of a sapling, which I've chopped in the nearest grove. I had no time to look for something better. It is curved, but it works. And what's this? It is a balance weight. So, if there is some obstacle in the stone or something jams, the balance weight helps to grind this obstacle, and it's efficient. What is it made of? This time I've cast it of plaster. But it can also be made of stone. The, the simplest balance weights that we can see in Egyptian frescoes are made of several separate weights. These may be either stones or sacks filled with sand, for instance. Egyptians simply secured those weights with ropes. It also works well. I've tried this method before and shared photos. So, in general, everything here is authentic, just like in ancient times. So, yes, you say we can drill a bore in a piece of granite using this stuff, for sure. Well then, let's start our experiment. First, we have to secure the piece of granite, because it's pretty small. It is not a granite slab, which we can just lay down and drill. That's why we have to hold it in place, somehow to prevent its displacement. This cobblestone is rather small, and the first question people ask is, how can we drill a bore in an uneven surface? What do we have to start with? But the method is as old as the hills. This plank will help us to hold the drill bit, that is, the tube in place, and prevent it from moving aside. Mm. Now we're gonna secure it and press down. After this, we can drill without worrying about it slipping or displacing our tool. Mm. Well, I think we can start now. So, we won't use a laser? A laser? I'm not sure, it's hard to guess where it can be mounted here. Now, I put some plasticine under the plank to prevent abrasive from leaking out. Clay would be a better choice in this case, but I had no time to look for it. Sometimes we can see that Egyptians gouged out a small pit in stone and then drilled in that point. And they didn't use plasticine or something, because the pit itself held the drill bit and the sand. Here, let's make it like that. Let's press it. Remove excessive plasticine. And fix the plank with F clamps. They're not ancient Egyptian F clamps. Well, if we had a larger stone, I would have taken a longer plank, laid it onto the stone and called somebody with ancient Egyptian feet to stand on it.
наступили и to press and secure it. The drill bit eats into the first millimeters faster, so 15 minutes is enough to make a groove out, of which the drill bit won't jump, and we won't need the plank. No, we won't, but still we will leave it in its place, just because here we have a groove and abrasive is not leaking out of it. So, this is just more convenient. Also, I'll make a plasticine bead, a kind of a tray, where we'll be filling in with the abrasive. Everything is thought out. If we had a larger stone, we would have piled sand into a cone shape, without any bead around it, and poured water just right there. But here we'll just make a bead just like this, and then fill it with water just to make our task easier. Of course, we can pour water from the above, but if we have a bucket, let's use it. We might do that. Handyman. Smartly done. We need a laser. It would be easier with a laser. Yes. Well, let's pour sand right here. In fact, it is black carbolite with various admixtures. I think that natural corundite would work better. Let's put it here and pour some water. I hope the water is from the Nile. Surely. It's from my country house, from a cask. There are even some gnat worms, so everything is done right. Indeed, the whole secret is in gnat worms. Right you are, they gnaw granite out. Gnaw out, yeah. Now, let's proceed to the most interesting part. Show us your best stuff. Let's start. Let's position it into place. Done. Speed up now. Alex, the water is leaking out too fast. Let's stop. The water is leaking out. Why? I guess there's a leak in plasticine under the plank. Let's look at it. See, I'm pouring water and it's leaking out. Well, let's then open it and have a look. Let's see what we've got. About 40 minutes of drilling. They couldn't do that. Now I want to say a few words about what we're doing all this for. For what purpose we've been blistering our hands for two days and sweating over some strange experiment. The thing is that in the recent years quite a few people have become active on the Russian internet who pull the wool over others' eyes, in blogs and on social media. They argue that historians allegedly fool us, that history is all faked up, and that everything has not been the way history books tell us. In particular, they argue that the ancients were unskilled butterfingers, nearly talking apes, who couldn't make anything themselves. According to them, the truth is different, and all great monuments in the Americas, in Egypt, in China, and so on, 
were created by aliens, Atlanteans or some other mysterious civilizations. Besides, people of this sort are rather aggressive. They don't read, don't know and don't want to know anything. With this background, they naturally sell fiction, not facts to their audience. They show some impressive pictures, tell some wondrous stories, but in my opinion, all this leads to destruction of the Russian education and science. So, when we, and me between others, first attempted to popularize science, we found out that if something was written in popular articles, or even mentioned in public lectures, it anyway failed to convince people. That is, people need some action, some material evidence to see with their own eyes. So, we decided to shoot a series of videos of practical experiments in order to show these ancient technologies and process and prove that ancient people were capable of pulling off rather complicated technical tasks using such simple, even primitive tools. And there is enough well-known archaeological evidence. I often get messages like this. Your armchair scholars, in theory everything looks fine, but let's see what you can make in practice. Here you are, we can make this, and you see the results. One of the frequently asked questions is, how is it possible to drill overlapping bores? It seems impossible. If one bore is already drilled, the other one supposedly will be displaced, because the drill bit will creep away. In practice, there is nothing difficult. The method has been known since Adam was a boy. First, we put a template onto the point here, a bore will be drilled. We, we drill a bore, then shift the template and drill another bore. And that's the secret. In such a way, we can drill as many bores as we need. Then we can beat out drill cores and get a bigger cavity of some complex shape. We have drilled through about 48 millimeters, that is, we are slightly ahead of schedule and are worn out. Close to that. So, ancient Egyptians needed rest. So, Nikolai, let's finish and see the result. So, what do we have here? 50 millimeters. 49.8 to be more specific. Good, but there should be 50 millimeters exactly. Now, that's the most critical moment. We have to draw out the core without damaging it. But it's an easy task. With a small chisel, yes, we work with the chisel in this way. Just two knocks, just workmanship. Great! We sat down to take a rest and discuss the fruit of our righteous labor. Well, the fruit looks like that. First, we can see here that it slightly broadens to the bottom. When discussing such granite cores from ancient Egypt, it is widely stated that they broaden or alternatively narrow to the bottom and that it is impossible to get this shape. Using the method which we have used a moment ago, it is stated that some high-tech tool is needed for this purpose. And why is it shaped like that? 
because the drill bit is wobbling during drilling. And at the top it is wobbling heavier, because at the bottom it is thrusting against the material. Wobbling means traveling like that? Yes, it is traveling and thus grinding more granite at the top. That's why the bore is V-shaped in the cross-section. And this is our counter-argument to the frequent statement that ancient Egyptians could not make things like that. In practice, there is nothing difficult. In this sample, it is clearly seen that the bore matches its borehole perfectly. And it is clearly seen that the bore is broader at the top than at the bottom. Well, I hope this question is resolved. But I anticipate one more question about the sharpness of the cutting edge. Here is the cutting edge. Yes, it is argued that if one tries to draw granite with a copper tube, it will go blunt very soon. But here we see quite the opposite. Can you show this? Yes, the tube does not go blunt, but becomes sharper. In other words, our drill bit is self-sharpening. Yes, it is a self-sharpening drill bit. I'm not sure if it is visible here, but the wall thickness has decreased. When we measured it before we started, it was 1.8 millimeters. Let's measure it once more. And now 1.6. So it turns out that the tube has become sharper. Yes, 1.6 millimeters. That is, two tenths of a millimeter have gone at this depth. Mm. If we drill deeper and the balance weight were lighter, the tube would become even sharper. The tube would become even sharper, almost as sharp as a knife blade. You can Google pictures where a needle is stuck into the cut left after tubular drilling. We can also stick a needle into our cut and get almost the same picture. A certain narrowing, yes, the same narrowing is here. It is a little bit thinner than in our samples, but here, and the same is here. Just the same narrowing to the bottom. And here are those much spoken about grooves. It is argued that grooves in ancient cores have a helical pitch of exactly 2 millimeters, and that it means that the two should cut 2 millimeters with each revolution. Well, first let's see what we have here, 2 millimeters or not. Let's do it this way. Are the grooves more visible now? Put the ruler here and measure the pitch. It varies. At one point I see less than 2 mm, at other points it is only 1 mm. Actually, the pitch varies pretty much. Naturally, in the same way it varies around Egypt. In cross-section bores can be either widening or narrowing to the bottom. At first I experimented with a drill bit, with a longitudinal split. That is, I took a copper sheet, wrapped it around a metal tube and secured it with hose clamps. There was a longitudinal split here. The major advantage of this split was that it let the abrasive inside. Maybe that was why the grooves were more regular at that time. In other words, if a drill bit has a split, then it will unbend itself during drilling because of its own wobbling, which is clearly seen in the video. The tube unbends itself gradually, and the bore becomes well-shaped in cross-section. So, if we drill with a split tube, then the bore will broaden to the bottom. But if we drill with an unsplit tube like this one, then vice versa. Yes, the bore will narrow to the bottom, because the tube will not unbend itself. One can measure the bore from inside and see that it really narrows. Mm -hmm. That's all I guess. Right.